everyone. Uh, it's 8 02, so we will start the session now. So, thank you everyone for uh, tuning in our Thursday talk shop session today. My name is Xiaxuan, and I'm from the Li Kang Chen Natural History Museum's Outreach and Education Unit. So, please note that uh, today's session will be about one hour long, including the questions and answers segment. And the session will also be recorded and uploaded to our museum website in due time. So, our speaker for today's session is Miss Kathy Po, an oral historian at our museum. So, you can actually tell that we are both in the same office right now. Okay, our backgrounds are very similar. Yeah. So um Kathy actually graduated from Yale and US with a specialization in art history, and her research interests lie at the intersections uh, of visual culture and natural history. So uh Kathy, hello. Um for the participants today who may be unfamiliar with your job title, which is oral historian, right? Could you perhaps briefly introduce your role in the museum? Yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, okay, cool. Yeah, so my job at the museum is oral historian and I'm, I'm currently working on an institutional oral history project for the museum. So what I'm doing is speaking to people who have worked at the museum for a very long time or who have worked uh, with the museum in the past. And um, yeah, like uh, what I'm doing is recording their stories and capturing a side of the museum that uh, can't really be seen through official records and documents. Yeah, so that's my job. And this is uh, very unrelated to that. So speaking on that topic, uh, so how do you even start your research on culinary and cultural histories of stingrays in Singapore? Mm, yeah, I actually started this project as a paper for a class that I was doing uh, two years ago with Professor Anthony Medrano from Yale New College when he's speaking next week. Yeah, so uh, this was a project that I did for that class and um, the class was uh, called Edible Oceans and we were looking at hawker dishes in Singapore that had some element of the ocean in it and I chose sambal stingray because uh, well, it's a delicious dish, right? And I wanted to uh, look into the history of the stingray more because I realized that I knew nothing about it. Yeah, so that was really the main motivation. And then, um, yeah, the paper was written and then um, here I am. <laughs> Yeah, I think we are all really excited to learn more about stingrays or in particular sambal stingray. Uh, so I'll leave you to share your slides now. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen. So in the meantime, uh, for anyone who has any questions for Kathy, feel free to uh, type them and submit them in the chat box at any point of time during her sharing. So uh, Kathy will address these questions towards the end of the session after, after her presentation. Okay, so we can start. Yeah, so uh, yeah, thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, I hope everyone has had dinner, although I think, yeah, hopefully the slides won't make everyone too hungry um, because I'm going more into the stingray than uh, just sambal stingray as a dish itself. Um, and yeah, I really look forward to further discussion uh, in the Q&A session, um, for, but for now, uh, I hope that I will be able to take you all on a fun ride back in time. And my sharing today starts with, oh, sorry, hold on. Yeah, starts with uh, this plate of sambal stingray, which is a dish that so many Singaporeans are very familiar with, you know, like the banana leaf that is just so nicely charred. Uh, and there's this generous layer of sambal balachan that's, um, uh, laid over the ray meat and then there are condiments like the chinchalok uh, and this lime and of course the onion that adds its own uh, complexity to the flavors that are already um, all together in this dish. And um, so with all these condiments, the ray meat provides texture and it's the protein of the dish, but considering how intensely rich all these condiments are, uh, the ray meat itself almost becomes like a backdrop, like a blank canvas upon which an artwork is painted. And I thought that this dynamic was very interesting to me because if the flavors of sambal stingray are defined more 
by the condiments than the ray meat itself, then what sets it apart from uh, other sambal-based dishes like uh, sambal sotong, which is squid, or sambal kangkong, which is water spinach, or sambal petai, which is bitter beans. And um, I think there seems to be a kind of charisma to sambal stingray, uh, perhaps because of how unusual ray meat seems to be as an ingredient, um, perhaps also uh, because of other infamous reputations of this creature in popular culture. So for example, many of us, or at least from uh, my generation, might think of Steve Irwin, the Australian conservationist who passed away after he was pierced in the chest by a short tail stingray. And I think most of us would say that, well, the sambal stingray dish wouldn't be what it is without the stingray, right? Yet the, the meat itself is so elaborately dressed, embellished and flavored that it becomes barely visible, you know, like even from this picture, it's just hiding beneath the sambal. And so this research project is, was my attempt to kind of scrape aside a bit of the sambal and the other condiments and kind of to bring the ray itself into the spotlight to ask questions about it. Like how or when did stingray become a part of uh, local food culture and what other species that have been consumed? And um, through looking at these questions and yeah, just like asking more questions along the way, I hope that we can collectively move towards uh, gaining a better understanding and a deeper appreciation for the ray itself uh, and see it as something more than just an edgy, cool, uh, exotic ingredient in a hawker dish. Yeah, and uh, sorry, this is my presentation outline for the evening. So first I'll give an overview of the kind of stories that tend to be discussed uh, when we talk about uh, like sambal stingray as a dish. And then I'll go into some reasons uh, that I think this topic of the stingray is important. And after that, I'll move into discussing various aspects about uh, the ray in our regional food history, and as well as also different kinds of cultural elements that relate to the stingray. Yes, yeah, so uh, first off, sambal stingray as we know it today. And um, in thinking about sambal stingray, there seems to be a general consensus on the streets that, well, it's not exactly an old dish, but it's definitely well known. And as food blogger Lassie Tay puts it, most Singaporeans would likely consider it to be part of our food heritage. And in Lassie Tay's blog post about sambal stingray, which I took this quote from, uh, another thing that I thought was really interesting is how stingray made its way into The Simpsons. So I think this episode was uh, from 2011, from uh, season five, something like that. Uh, is this episode called The Food Wife, where Marge Simpson dreams about being in a Singapore street food market and Anthony Bourdain shows up uh, to offer her hang her kuei chap, which she translates as triple spicy barbecued stingray stuffed with pig organs. And of course, I think for most of us, we know that this is uh, a profane mashup of sambal stingray and kuei chap, um, but which to, to, like, to us Singaporeans, these two dishes are very delicious on their own, but you know, mashed up in such a way to a Western, Western audience that like, it would probably seem bizarre and probably a little bit grotesque as well. And I mean, this whole issue of non-Western food being exoticized is something that uh, deserves its own discussion as well. But for now, let's just say that, I mean, the fact that the Stingray made it onto The Simpsons is proof of its iconic status. And if we want to dive deeper into the history of this dish, I think one of the narratives that has been somewhat canonized is how sambal stingray is an adaptation of ikan baka or barbecued fish. Um, and this newspaper article by Margaret Chan from 1986 uh, introduces barbecued stingray as a new hawker food that emerged in the mid 80s with its origin traceable to Penang where it appeared about 10 years prior to this article and only appeared in Singapore around, uh, according to her estimate, I guess around 1984 or so. And on the other hand, I think there are also other stories that pass through word of mouth. Um, for example, like uh, in this case, how certain hawkers might claim to be the first uh, to serve barbecued stingray in Singapore. Uh, 
Yeah, and it's quite a similar story. Uh, this movement of the dish from Penang to Singapore, uh, before it became an iconic hawker dish uh, in Singaporean food culture. And I think something quite interesting here that comes up is also how uh, Leslie Tay highlights the trickiness of preparing ray meat. Uh, and I quote, uh, I think in those days, stingray was really cheap because hardly anyone knew what to do with the fish, which can sometimes reek of ammonia. Slathering it with a fiery sambal chili proved to be a real game changer. Since ammonia is alkaline, the tamarind juice in the sambal chili acts as an acid to neutralize it, and the potent chili helps mask other off-putting flavors. And this is something we can take note of as we continue through the rest of the session. And I think a common thread uh, in both of these stories is that uh, sambal stingray began in the 80s, uh, migrated from Penang to Singapore, uh, yeah, but I was curious about whether there was a longer history to the presence of stingray in our regional food culture. Because surely, I mean, if the pungence of ray meat made it so difficult to consume, the choice to turn stingray into food couldn't have just emerged out of the blue uh, with no reason. Yeah, and uh, why care about the ray? I think apart from pure curiosity, one of the main reasons why I wanted to explore this topic further was because of, I think, this sense of uh, a kind of tension between the culinary and ecological value of the stingray. So like, if we think about ray meat uh, being cheap because it tasted bad and nobody wanted to eat it, then in this context, sambal stingray feels like almost a miracle dish, like a, a wonder invention that turned something inedible into something that uh, is almost divine. Yet at the same time, for all the deliciousness that sambal stingray is, there are also a number of ecological issues uh, surrounding ray meat consumption. And this is something that uh, we need to recognize as well. So firstly, many of the species that go into sambal stingray are well caught marine rays, uh, and they tend to reproduce at a slow rate. So for this reason, uh, many ray species have their populations threatened by overfishing you know, for food or for the aquarium trade. And of course, there's also the problem of habitat loss. And so it's unsustainable to consume them. And secondly, there's also a lack of availability of information about which ray species are being caught and used as food fish. So I think there are two aspects to this. Uh, one is the mislabeling of ray and skate meats as shark meat uh, being a common occurrence. Like I got this from a 2014 report. Um, and also uh, for the consumer and the general public, ray meat is often despined and cut up before it appears in places like the supermarket uh, and hawker stores. Uh, and so stingray meat is just what it is. Like it's meat meant to be eaten. And one more reason that I felt it was important to look into cultural histories of the stingray is that um, when we say that barbecued stingray was like so-called birthed in the 1980s, like this kind of language way of thinking of like, oh, there was an origin to this dish, like that there is a danger that um, it omits any earlier cultural interactions that don't fit into a straightforward, simplified origin story in that sense. And I think to me, it's like a kind of cultural amnesia. And I wanted to investigate and try to uh, bring together uh, like earlier relationships that our society has had with the Ray. Um, yeah, and I have these two pictures that kind of show uh, Ray meat as it appears like at a, a storefront or uh, in a supermarket. And yeah, it's, like it's not really labeled. Um, and if it's cut up uh, in this manner, like in front of the hawker store, like you can't really tell what species it is. Um, yeah, but uh, now after this introduction, let's get on the time machine and travel back a few decades. Um, yeah, and so first, I guess the topic I want to start with is demand and prices. Uh, and I wanted to begin with this excerpt from Isaac Henry Burkill's A Dictionary of the Economic Products of the Malay Peninsula. And even though it's uh, just a short excerpt on um, one entry of the trigon genus of sting-tilt rays, it's actually very rich with information. 
So the first thing we get is that uh, rays were consumed by the poorer classes uh, and they were preserved through salting and drying methods. And uh, Berkey also talks about the type of nets that rays tend to be caught in. Uh, so for example, seine nets, drift nets, stick nets, or long lines of unbaited barbless hooks, which are set in places that the fish are known to be frequent in. And I think there are two things that are happening here. Uh, one is that uh, the rays might have been getting unintentionally tangled in nets, but also fishermen knew where and how to fish these rays if they wanted to. And I would also like to draw our attention to the end of the paragraph. Um, during the walking of the government trawler in 1925-6-7, large hauls of stingrays were made at times and their storage was a problem. They had to be isolated to prevent spoilage of other fish. And when the fish room hatch was lifted on arrival in port, the strong ammoniacal smell from the rays was such to suggest a leakage in the refrigeration plant. So it must have been really very intense, like this same kind of ammonia smell that we read about earlier. Um, except uh, from what Berkeley says, I mean, these fish were being consumed by people and they had methods of uh, dealing with it. And also apart from Berkeley, there was this other dude named uh, Charles Neville Maxwell. And um, from his book called Malayan Fishes, uh, under the entry on eagle rays, he also notes very similar phenomena that rays and skates are eaten by locals. Uh, they form a considerable proportion of trawler catches, and it's a cheap food for which there is demand both fresh and salted. And one thing that I'd like to add before moving on is that um, probably uh, the reason why uh, these haul, uh, the hauls of stingrays were huge uh, from trawlers uh, it's, it can be explained by uh, stingrays feeding habits because uh, a lot of them are bottom feeders. And so that's so why when the trawl scoops uh, the seabed, um, a lot of these stingrays will end up being scooped out. Yeah. And on the point that ray meat was cheap, it really was indeed so. Uh, so here I have one example of a price list which showed the current prices at Clyde Terrace Market in Singapore, which was also known as Beach Road Market. And this was from 14 November, 1922. Uh, and I've also looked at a few other published price lists uh, in the papers across this period of time, and the prices are all quite similar. So I think this is a good representation. Um, it's quite interesting to look at the range in prices. So rays were going at 10 cents per kati, and one kati is around half a kilogram, I think. And uh, apart from ray pari, there's also tingiri, which is Spanish mackerel. And that one's a bit more expensive. Uh, it's 55 cents per kati. And that one's used in otak otak. And uh, yeah, you can look at the rest as well. And I think it's, I was surprised that uh, rays were even cheaper than mixed small fish, which were going at 15 cents per kati. And my guess is that um, the cheap price might have been a result of the combination of both the ammonia smell, which made it perhaps a bit harder to handle, and also secondly, the fact that rays were constantly being brought up in abundance, whether intentionally or not. Yeah, um, but for now, let's move on to look at um, preparation methods, recipes, and species. Uh, so just continuing on with the notion of ray meat being historically cheap, I also found the 1980 recipe in the newspapers for stingray curry with gam chai, salted vegetables. And it seems that the main selling point of this recipe is the fact that it's a cheap yet nutritious dish that people could make at home. And the author notes that ikan pari is probably the cheapest fish available. And also, I thought it was really interesting how in the ingredients, the amount of gam chai and curry paste uh, were measured not, not in spoonfuls or weight, but by price. Yeah, and I think looking at this recipe and also at uh, Berkeley and Maxwell's writings earlier, and of course, knowing the price of ray meat in the market, it was really likely one of the most accessible sources of protein for people. Uh, and indeed, it was um, probably being consumed widely, if not yet as street food, then um, definitely at home since this was uh, a recipe in the newspapers targeted at readers. 
And I think there's also definitely a class aspect to remit consumption in the past as well, even though um, this association now probably isn't as strong anymore. And I wanted to show a few more entries from Berkeley's book. I think it's such a great reference because uh, he documents quite a variety of ray genera and with a level of detail that would enable us to distinguish and recognize species based on not just their descriptions, but also their local vernacular names, the ways they were caught, and also get an understanding of how different ray species were used in different ways. And here we have a description of the spotted eagle ray, uh, Atobatis nari nari. And from reading this excerpt, um, we know that the fish was not very abundant uh, and they were caught unintentionally in nets set for Spanish mackerel, if not on long lines that were baited with fish. And it was also consumed uh, both fresh and salted. And yeah, just I guess for contemporary contextualization in our time now, I think this is now a threatened species. And uh, here are two other genera of eagle rays that Berkeley talks about as food fish. Uh, which also had their own local names. And under Menta, uh, Berkeley also goes into a description of how these rays are salted. So the wings are cut away from the main skeleton and they're sliced. And then um, salt is, is put in between and then the whole piece is covered in salt. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, I'll go more into discussing names later, but for now, I think what we can say from uh, this material we've seen is that certainly we have old records of different race species being consumed as food fish, and salting was also a widespread method that was used to prepare and preserve ray meat. And also we have this 1950 article that goes into describing a different method of salting rays. Um, instead of salt, saline liquid is used. So the ray, after being quartered, is immersed in uh, saline liquid for a few days. And I think this article in particular is also, uh, it also fits nicely into the sambal stingray um, story. Uh, because if you look to the end of the last paragraph, uh, thin, thin slices of the ikampari saltfish grilled or fried a golden brown made with the sambal so nice a savory for the evening plate of rice. So, I mean, in this way, I think we could consider this as a precedent to the sambal stingray that we know today. And actually also on this, uh, the pairing of sambal and fish or seafood more broadly, I guess, really goes way back, which is perhaps not that surprising after all. And here is a recipe for saltfish sambal from 1912. Um, and in this case, I think the salt fish is an ingredient for the sambal itself. Uh, yeah, and we could also look at sambal stingray as a dish that has evolved from these different recipes and methods from preparing on cons and consuming ray meat as well as fish and sambal. And if we want to go even further back a bit more to the mid 19th century, there is also a recipe for crab sambal uh, in Fedor Jago's book, uh, Singapore, Malacca, Java, which was published in 1866. So Jago was a German naturalist who was traveling through Asia to collect for Berlin museums. And I also did a rough translation of the crab sambal recipe, if you'd like to uh, see it briefly, uh, and also include a, a additional notes by Jago explaining balachong, which we know um, and are more familiar with as balachan and uh, also coconut milk. Yeah, and yeah, it's like, I mean, it's, it really goes way earlier than the 1980s. Yeah, and uh, I think so, let's take a short break from looking at a lot of words and go into uh, visual records. And I think maybe you might think like, how are scientific images relevant to food history? Um, and we're back at looking at uh, Maxwell's Malayan Fishes book again. And although this was a scientific publication, uh, Maxwell studied and documented a lot of his fish from Clyde Terrace Market, which used to be the biggest market in Singapore selling uncooked food. Uh, 
And this market was where a lot of the fishermen's catches would go. Uh, and if a colonial officer wanted to study fish, but wasn't able to go out to sea, then the fish market would be the next best place to go to observe the biodiversity, uh, the marine biodiversity of the region. And so this particular page is a photograph of Paris betting that Maxwell the Clyde Terrace market. And while Maxwell was doing his photography, the inspector of the Clyde Terrace market, whom there is very little information on, but we know as Mr. W. Farrell, uh, he also procured specimens of interest and donated a number of them to the Raffles Museum at that time. And this example is a young specimen of sea devil or ox ray, which measured about nine inches across and is still in our museum's collections today. And yeah, because fish markets made important contributions to scientific research in the early, early 20th century, uh, I think we can also flip it around to look at these documented species as food of their time uh, to get a better sense of the variety of fishes that locals were likely consuming in the past. And I think one of the very important uh, illustration uh, to look at is this drawing of a blue spotted fantail ray from John Edward Gray's illustrations of Indian zoology from 1829. So I think this was one of the first species of fish that was described from Singapore, even though the name uh, Trigon ornatus is now considered to be a later name for a species already described by Peter Foscal in 1775 as Tenura lima. And um, well, yeah, that's not the exact specimen that was depicted, but if you come down to our galleries, you'll, we have that on display. Yeah, and I think that particular specimen was collected in 1995 at Raffles Lighthouse. Yeah, and um, in the current day, the blue spotted phantom ray is, I think it's considered one of the most abundant rays in the coral reefs in our region. Uh, it's harvested commercially as seafood, and small, small specimens are still taken for the aquarium trade. Uh, and it's a near threatened species. But I think if you see it in the waters, uh, be careful though, because it's venomous. Yeah. And um, moving on, we also have this, which is perhaps one of the earliest visual documentations of a uh, Singapore market scene. And, and the ray also appears, if, if you see it. Uh, it's in this pile of fish that uh, is behind the squatted fishmonger. And so I think seeing all of this, I think uh, stingray as a food fish has definitely been around for over a century. And with this, I'd like to move on to discuss other cultural, uh, historical cultural presences of the stingray in our region. And for that, one very cool area to look at is weaponry. Uh, so, and the article on the left uh, from 1972, I think, uh, scholars such as G.B. Gardner have suggested that the Malay Keris knife was inspired by a discovery of how the stingray spine could be used as a dagger. And he goes on to note how ray daggers were found deep inland from the coast, indicating that they had been used as a sort of weapon. And while um, this was perhaps a theory that he proposed, um, the observation of ray daggers is not that far off. And um, to support this point with a different source, I think it was just a decade ago, uh, archaeologists also discovered cowtail stingray spines in the Nia cave in Sarawak in Borneo. And uh, it's speculated that they were possibly used as hunting tools during the early Holocene period, which was about 12,000 years ago. And um, this whole thing about uh, raised spine daggers is not something that's just stuck in the past either. Uh, so, I mean, these were being seized in Singapore in the 70s, as we see in the image on the right. Yeah, and our friend Burkill, he also spoke of ray spines and ray tails being made into weapons. Uh, and this entry in particular is about rays in the Trigon genus. And Burkill talks about skins being used for the handles of weapons, spines being used for weapons. He goes on a bit about poison and then also talks about how uh, skins were being used as sandpaper, 
and then oil from the ray liver was being used as food, soap manufacturer, used in leather dressing, lighting, and I suppose lubricating for perhaps machinery. Yeah, and there's this sense that the, the ray itself is quite multi-purpose and almost the whole fish and its different parts could be used for something or another. And um, moving into names and etymology, uh, I wanted to um, talk a bit about contemporary common terms that are used to refer to rays as food fish. Um, these days, I think they're all quite general, um, nothing species specific. And the first two are uh, fang yu, which translates to square fish, and mo kui yu, which translates to devil fish. I think these are two Chinese names that I know I used uh, in the context of sambal stingray quite interchangeably, although devil fish is uh, sometimes specifically used to refer to manta rays. And if you recall, this is a similar term to sea devil that we saw earlier in the Clyde Terrace Market Young Ray specimen. And I think it's interesting how um, the image that devil fish, this name conjures, is an interesting contrast to ikan pari, where pari is possibly derived from pari pari, which is the Malay word for fairy. And um, it might be a visual visualization of how rays tend to navigate through the water, um, you know, like propelling themselves forward by flapping the sides of their bodies like wings. And I think from the newspaper articles that I've seen, um, the primary term used to refer to rays in Singapore, even in English language newspapers, was probably ikan pari. And it's curious, curious how this name and other Malay names for the ray have become far less commonly heard, at least for the non-Malay speaking Singaporean spheres that I find myself being in. And uh, yeah, there are many other vernacular names. So ikan pari is more generic, um, but uh, especially in Berkeley's writings, I think we find so many other names that go down to the specificity of species. So like, for example, here we have Pari Kalawa, which is bat skate, Pari Betting, skate of shallows, Pari Bendera, uh, with Bendera meaning flag, Pari Daun, Daun meaning leaf. And I think from this presence of different vernacular names that uh, distinguish rays down to the species level, um, it seems that the amount of ray knowledge in a public circulation back then was definitely richer and more complex than what we have today, uh, or at least in the use of English language in everyday life now. Uh, and that's the thing, right? I think we like to think that uh, in our own times now, education is uh, certainly a lot more accessible and people have so much information at the tip of their fingers. Um, but maybe maybe there's also a lot of knowledge that we have left behind in time, you know, as lifestyles and language have continued to evolve. Yeah, and on the topic of names, uh, there's one more example I have here. So in Maxwell's writing, he investigates and break down, breaks down the name Paridida. And uh, Paridida is a common name for the porcupine ray, which I've pictured here. Uh, Maxwell goes into the meanings of the word didap and its derivatives and uh, so he notes that didap is an obsolete Malay term for shield in colloquial Malay and he also highlights the similarities between the appearance of rayfish and the bark of the didap tree which he says is studded with spines of the same limpet-like shape as the fish. And I think for me personally, etymology is so interesting because by just taking part a name like this, we find it linked through language to so many other elements of a shared uh, locality, a shared place. So in this case, um, the ray becomes connected or associated with a tree, a shield, a drum, or maybe even a skin condition. And yeah, like so much of a locality, its culture, its people uh, can be embedded within just one name like that. Uh, yeah, and the same species uh, is also mentioned by Berkeley. And just going back to the notion of weapons for a bit, uh, Berkeley notes that the tail of this ray was used as a file and formerly also as a switch. So like the kind of rods used for uh, punishment. Yeah, and um, 
The last thing I want to touch on is road names. So there's this network of roads near Simpang Bodok that have been named after different varieties of ikan pari. And I mean, it's not the only case uh, where there are a cluster of roads named after a variety of something. Like, for example, I know in Bukit Timah, there's also some streets with names like Lorong Pisang Ayam or, or Lorong Pisang Udang. And of course, with Pisang meaning banana. And I mean, there's another whole black hole to go down here on road names. But for now, let's continue to follow the stingray. And um, I looked at some old maps and uh, what I found and what I think we can say for sure is that the street names have been around since 1977. Uh, can't pinpoint the exact year that these roads came into existence, but it's probably not that old. Um, but even then, I think 1977 is uh, means that this ro these road names still go back further than the mid-80s that, uh, that we tend to talk about when we talk about some Boston race origins. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, if anyone knows anything else about these road names, I, I would love to hear. Yeah, um, but yeah, so even though I reached a dead end on the road names, uh, I tried to dive deeper into the history of the area. And so I think one thing that's quite notable is that the river that cuts diagonally across the top of the map uh, above Jalan Pari Burong is Sungai Budok which itself is a very old river and the earliest record of it, as some people might know, uh, it goes back to a 1604 Portuguese map of our island. And I found that, uh, unsurprisingly, historically there have been villages along Sungai Budok. So it seems that these places, places like Simpang Budok village, um, these were inhabited by fishermen and there were both Malay and Chinese fishermen in the area, which makes sense because there's a river there and then the open sea is really just a stone to throw away. And yeah, I mean, given what we know now about rays and how they were caught in abundance and they were cheaply available in the market, fishermen in, in the 19th century, early 20th century would likely have encountered them quite regularly, perhaps not just in a catch, but also as food, like fresh, salted with sambal. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I'm nearing the end of the talk, but yeah, I think so. I hope I've been able to show how there was sambal stingray before, sambal stingray that we know of. And there's also so much more to stingray than, you know, it just being delicious with sambal. Um, yeah, and if we look at uh, the sambal stingray, uh, being just part of this far longer history of race in our food and culture, there's a lot more that meets the eye. Yeah, that's the end. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks for your very generous sharing. I think what was very interesting to me was the race spine dagger. So do you happen to know if there are any like countries or cultures that you still use the race spine dagger since it's no longer used in Singapore? Right, yeah, I think that I didn't go very far into investigating that. Um, perhaps it could be a future project for someone. Yeah, um, yeah, so I, yeah, I really haven't looked into that, but I guess within our region, it's like, it seems that there's been this very long relationship with the ray and like knowing it uh, as a source or a uh, material that can be used to make weapons as well. Yeah. If anyone has questions for Katie, please uh, feel free to type it in the chat box or you can also use the raise hand uh, function in Zoom and just voice out your questions for Bert. Looks like nobody has questions. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, maybe I'll just uh, share my screen. Okay, should I stop sharing? No worries. Ah, okay, someone raised a uh, button. Would you like to unmute yourself? Ask your question. Hi, Kathy. Thank you very much for the presentation. I have a question about you mentioning skate. So would you be able to elaborate, is skate more shark or is skate supposed to be more ray? Or is it loosely used for both? Oh, okay. So the thing is, I am actually not science trained. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, it's, I think I, I feel like I wouldn't be able to uh, give a very good answer to that. But from what I've seen in the research that I did, I think 
they're both distinct groups and they're like sharp rays and skates are all distinct groups, but perhaps skates are closer to rays. Okay, thank you. Nobody else has questions. Uh, I guess that's the end of uh, the talk. So, oh, okay. So, uh, uh, he's actually uh, a fish researcher at our user. He has actually replied Bernard's question that skates and rays have their gill openings facing ventrally. So, I guess it means that um, skates are more related to rays than to fishes. Else has questions. Uh, uh, I really, really appreciate it if you could actually help us to fill the feedback form for this session. And you can also suggest topics that you would like us to cover for our future talk shop sessions if you are organizing it again, maybe in the later part of the year or next year. Yeah, so please take a few minutes to fill in the feedback form by scanning the QR code at the right side. Thank you everyone, have a great night and uh, we also have a talk next week, um, it's also next Thursday 8pm, uh, it's actually a talk by Cathy's uh, ex-lecturer, uh, Dr. Anthony, so Dr. Anthony's talk is actually on food fishes, or rather how the food fishes in Singapore have actually shaped our culture. Thank you so much. So hopefully we'll see you online again next week at 8 p.m.